Hey everyone, my name is Michael Blight. I'm an assistant professor of communication and media studies at North Central College. We are just located outside of Chicago, the western suburbs in Naperville, Illinois. So hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I, my title is a little bit misleading because I teach courses in public relations. I oversee a public relations uh, student run public relations firm. But a lot of the research that I do is tied within my PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, which is communication and technology. When I talk to people that don't really know anything about uh, sort of what I do or, or what research entails, I basically tell them that I'm very interested in how people communicate online, mostly with social media, but I'm also interested in how people get information from the world around them. And on the public relations end of that, which is how I satisfy my actual job description, I'm also concerned with this notion of how brands are able to best communicate their messages with people, especially in the case of crisis uh, or crises, depending on the brand and uh, where they are. So if you can tell anything, it's probably that my research interests are sort of all over the board. So the second question uh, what paradigm guides your work? I'm primarily a post-positive researcher uh, in terms of the idea of truth. What is truth? I think there's a certain objectivity to the universe uh, in the world that guides us. I do primarily quantitative data, but I don't shy away from qualitative data, including focus groups and, and survey uh, instrumentation and, and everything uh, along those lines. But for the most part, I'm mostly trying to figure out how is it that I can best, and this is something that, that you as students should be thinking about as well, is how can I best get to the answer to the questions that I have uh, without falling victim to the law or the rule of the hammer, right? Everything looks like a nail when the only tool that you wield is a hammer. I think that some of us have natural inclination to a certain type of methodology based on the perception that we have, the paradigm that drives us and the understanding of truth and the epistemology that accompanies that. But for the most part, I, I think I am at least open to the idea that there are other possibilities and there are other mechanisms at which I can utilize to get to the answers that I'm searching. Um, that sort of goes into the third question a little bit, which, which is what methods do you typically use in your research? Uh, I've done, especially with, with my dissertation data set in, from 20, 14 and 2015, thinking about big data pools, rich data that have uh, quantitative and qualitative items that are within it, open-ended uh, questions as well as closed-ended Likert type scales. So I think in general, having the, if nothing else, having the opportunity methodologically to ask open-ended questions, to get a sense of, of a theme or a narrative that, it, that exists within the data at least gives you descriptive data that you can go back to, you can reference, you can think about in a meaningful way. And even if you don't end up using it, I think it's sometimes helpful if you are, I am surely a quantitative researcher, numbers and data. I think that there's something to be said about thinking about your participants' viewpoint in a meaningful way, sitting down, reading through, combing through the data and trying to find out some in interesting tidbits of information. If nothing else, you get a nice title uh, for the manuscript that you put together based on a quotation that somebody said as you were asking them to fill out information about you know, whatever topic it is that, that you're, you're seeking to pursue. What skills are important for new researchers to learn? In general, I think the skill set that is probably the most important for you to consider is the willingness to be wrong, which feels more like a trait than an inherent skill. But I'll explain to you why I think that's particularly important, both in life and research and, and all the realms that overlap in between that. Your willingness to be wrong, and I'm sure your advisors and certainly the reviewers for the manuscripts that you submit out to, to journals, they will tell you that you're wrong. The people who are responsible for telling you that you're wrong, it's good that they're telling you that you're wrong. They're hopefully coming from a place of care, at least your advisors are, or your peers, or whoever it is, your, your co-authors. But I think you need to get into the habit of trying to play a little bit of a devil's advocate with your own work. And in my experience, my perspective, the thing that the skill that I would recommend people try to identify and hone is being comfortable not knowing the answer. As a matter of fact, one of the main reasons a lot of us get into a research-based discipline, or if you, you know, want to pursue being a professor or researcher in any capacity, you have to be comfortable being comfortable. You have to be able to articulate 
audibly say in front of a group of people, I don't know why this phenomenon is happening, or I think I have a hunch, but I'm really curious to find out why that hunch is or is not correct. And I think that mindset is something that you can you can certainly build up and refine over time. There are obviously other really great answers in terms of you have to be able to, uh, and skill set wise, you have to be able to come through the data. You have to be able to uh, have experience with R or SPSS, and, and those are certainly important skills depending on the the methodology that you're you're trying to approach and the data analysis and, and whatever. But in terms of just the tangible thing that you can identify that you can work on, you can build over time. I think just the willingness to be wrong, the willingness to be uncomfortable, the willingness to say, I don't know, or man, this goes against everything that I thought from the beginning and it goes against literature. What the heck? Am I am I a fool? I think you have to have a healthy balance of confidence that you did all the things you did the research when you were looking at the literature that you were combing through for the sake of building out a lit review but also the confidence to say i did the data analysis i'm seeing what i'm seeing i'm seeing these significant relationships between variables i don't know why it's so divergent and that should excite you being unsure being uncomfortable with an answer like that uh, what is a project that you're working on right now that you're really excited about i'm so glad that i asked that to myself right now so I am, I am overseeing an undergraduate research team. We are an undergraduate institution at North Central. And we are looking, and this, this actually came out of a class project wherein one of my students was looking at influencers. Influencers, I just wrote a chapter about influencers, health influencers on Instagram and some of the data concerns that exist with user-generated content. So that technically answers the question in terms of projects. I'm very interested in influencers and new media technology, social media, like Instagram. But in this case, I had a student who was writing a paper about influencers and uh, her name's Courtney. And she wanted to pursue this a little bit further. And we talked about undergraduate research. I said, this is a cool opportunity. And so we, we looped in two other people who were in the class and we have this really cool undergraduate research team. And basically what we're doing is we are looking at uh, using the uh, uncertainty reduction theory, Benoit's uh, uncertainty reduction theory. We are, uh, I'm sorry, uncertainty reduction theory. We're using Benoit's image repair theory. I'm just gonna leave it in for the sake of being wrong on camera. Image repair theory. Uh, and we are looking at the types of strategies that influencers use when constructing apology videos. And so you can think about Logan Paul and, and the Japanese forest incident, and there's a ton of influencers who have issued apology videos. So using image repair theory, we are, we are coding through, we actually transcribed a bunch, I think 30 plus influencer apology videos. We transcribed all of them, and then we thematically coded using the categories of image repair tactics and strategies um, and, and found out basically, without spoiling it, uh, what it is that influencers typically do in terms of establishing goodwill, trying to repair their image. And that's where the public relations comes in, right? The influencers are a brand unto themselves. They have these faux pas, they have these mistakes wherein uh, they do something wrong and then they issue an apology. And so what, what do they say? How do they say it? Why is it important that they use a tactic? How do people respond to it? So we have a really cool, robust sort of new media project that we're, that we're working on now. Uh, it's about to be submitted to a journal, as a matter of fact, at time of recording this. So hopefully uh, that goes over well. Last question here. What methods topic could you talk about for hours? Why? What is important about the topic for undergraduates to know? So I, I personally, so I went to Illinois State as an undergraduate and a master's student. And our master's program at ISU is a generalist program in that you, we don't, we don't have an interpersonal track. We don't have any of this. You are forced for a reason by design to take classes and coursework all across a bunch of different disciplines, which is incredibly valuable to have in terms of the skills and knowledge and expertise to just have conversation with people to explore also as a scholar and just somebody who wants to learn about the universe of communication, the discipline is just to explore different topic areas. And so I became really enamored by theories, even though I just butchered uh, uncertainty reduction versus image repair, which are nothing alike, but alas, here we are. But I became really enamored by the connection between theory and research. And so what I would do, uh, and this happened with the phenomena of parasocial relationships, is that I 
was really fascinated. I wrote my master's thesis about parasocial relationships with television characters. And it happened to be as part of a pro seminar communication course that we were to find some sort of cool phenomena that exists within literature. I was looking at TV. I, I thought that was interesting as a first year master's student. And so I came across parasocial relationships, uh, Horton Wall in, in the 1950s, 1956. And all I wanted to do was find out more information about parasocial relationships, romance novels, radio stations, things that had nothing to do with each other. I just want to read more about it. And I think in general, you being able to being able to research the theory and also be able to make sense of the methodology that they used to actually examine the occurrence of that phenomena is really important. So yes, I know a lot of you are, are probably going to be hyper-focused on one sort of method, one approach, whether it be quantitative or qualitative, if you want to be a pragmatist versus a positivist versus a critical scholar. I would say, in my opinion, that it pays to be able to understand as many sort of methodologies and analyses as possible. But with that, I will also warn you that the, it requires a pretty hefty amount of investment just to learn about things that you might not ever use. But if you have a long and fruitful career, you might happen to collaborate on a piece where you use a particular approach uh, in terms of a method to, to figure out answers to certain things. I took a, a course in my doctoral program on a meta-analysis with Mike Allen, who many consider to be sort of the the king of meta-analysis. And I could not successfully without his aid right now and like the three books that I had to buy for data analysis or for meta-analysis, I couldn't do one independently. I would still need to, as an assistant professor, PhD in hand, I would still need help. But I could read a, a research manuscript and I could go through the methods and I could go through the analysis and I could make sense of it because of that training and understanding that extends far beyond uh, everything that I do, including grounded theory, including critical research, including things that are not and probably will never, ever, ever, ever be within my wheelhouse. But what I would say is that having some sort of flexibility, you can think about it like a utility belt or a Swiss army knife or whatever, whatever analogy you want to use or metaphor you want to use to describe this, but your capacity to be able to read and make sense of information opens up a floodgate of your capacity to just come across literature, come across research that you can then make sense of in a meaningful way past just reading the abstract, past reading the limitations of future directions and conclusion, but your willingness and ability to be uncomfortable, to go through different types of data sets, all of that is something that you should be willing and excited to do. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that this was uh, an exciting video for you to watch. And if it wasn't, then I uh, thank you for at least making it to the end.